All right, we're going to be talking about the number line, and you talked about the number line in pre-algebra. Um, we, we have a whole lot of numbers in our number system. In fact, we have an infinite number of numbers in our number system. So it helps to be able to make a picture of them and where they are in relation to each other. That's, excuse me, that's the reason for the number line. And typically we draw the number line with zero in the middle and the positive numbers are out here and the negative numbers are out here. And it goes a whole lot farther than five and negative five. Um, in fact, it goes to infinity, infinity being like a million, million, billion, 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 zillion, um, and beyond. And then out here, the negative numbers get bigger in the negative direction. Okay, and in between, these are called integers. And in between the integers, you have fractions and decimals. And they all get, hello, they all get closer and closer together. <clears throat> Little jump back to pre-algebra for a minute. Uh, people who are running in, just go ahead and grab a handout. It'll help you, I think. So this way, we're able to show all the integers, and we leave it to you to imagine where all the fractions and decimals are in between. Okay, and you already know from pre-algebra that the way we say that one number is bigger than another, one number is greater than another, is we can say 5 is greater than 3. A profound statement right there. 5 is greater than 3. Um, but you can actually go beyond that to notice that greater than and the direction right go together, and right is on the number line. Another way of saying greater than could be 5 is to the right of 3, which is true. 5 is to the right of 3. So 5 is greater than 3, and if you're thinking of the hungry alligator, right, the hungry alligator is opening his mouth to eat the, the bigger number because he's no fool. 5, I'm going to eat you. Zombie alligator. Okay. Well, it actually goes beyond that. Um, this is saying that one is less than five, but it's also saying one is to the left of five. So it ends up that left on the number line means the same as less, and right means the same as greater than, and that is incredibly obvious as long as you're over here on the right side of the number line, but once you get over to the negative side of the number line, it's not obvious anymore, okay, because, and I always found this really difficult, over here, Negative 5 is to the left of negative 1, so negative 5 is actually considered to be less than negative 1 because it's to the left on the number line. And I think that's kind of hard because you know that 5 is greater than 1, and, and the mind rebels against that. At least mine did. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind when you're over here on the negative side. Things feel kind of turned around. But still, in pre-algebra, you studied less than and greater than. And they were called order operations because they show the order on the number line, what's to the right and what's to the left. Um, and then these relationships are true, left and less. But now that you're in beginning algebra, we take a step forward. First, these are called strict inequalities. Because there's no fudging. Something is either less than or it's greater than. 
If you have two, two numbers sitting next to each other, one is going to be bigger and one is going to be smaller. One is going to be to the right and one is going to be to the left. And that's it. That's a very strict truth. If you pick any two numbers in the universe, one is going to be bigger and one is going to be smaller. But now, we do allow for a fudge factor. I get one of these. We do allow for a fudge factor. Um, we're going to be talking about less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. And that line underneath means or equal to. So you might want to say, well, how could I possibly think that 5 and 4 might be equal to each other. They're definitely not. 5 is greater than 4. But we're also going to be bringing x into the picture, some number I don't know. And so it's necessary sometimes to use this to say, well, x is less than 5, but, I mean, x is a number I don't know. So x could be less than 5, but maybe it's also equal to 5. I don't know what it is. So x might be less than, or it might be equal to 5. And so we're going to be talking about what that means and relating it to the handout. All right? Because what this says here, x is greater than negative 4, means you locate negative 4 on the number line, which is that convenient picture for locating our numbers in relation to each other. x is greater than negative 4, but let's face it, when you're on the number line, direction is a lot more important than saying one number being bigger, bigger than another. So this also says, since the arrow is pointing right, it also says x is to the right of negative 4. And there's no, no thinking it might be equal to because this is a strict inequality. So x is going to be any number in the universe on the number line, any number that is to the right of negative 4. So the way that we say that is since there's no possibility of being equal to, a parenthesis and an arrow, and this graph says exactly what that says. That x can be any number to the right of negative 4. Which means it could be negative 3.999999999, but definitely not negative 4. And that's just the way it is. So the parenthesis says no x this number I don't know, whatever it is, I do know for sure, I know two things for sure. I know it's not going to equal negative 4, and it's going to be located somewhere to the right of negative 4. And that's the way I say that. Um, there are a number of different ways to say it that we're going to talk about. In fact, there are four different ways to say it. So let's talk about the different ways to say it. There's this, which is x is to the right of negative 4. x is greater than negative 4. There's this way, which is to make a picture of it, to make a graph, and this is called the graph. Wonderful. And then there are two other ways to say it. Interval notation. Okay, we always talk about notation in math. Notation is a note. It's a way of writing. So there are different ways of writing the same thing, different ways of saying the same thing. Interval notation looks almost like the graph. And the way I was taught to do it is, because I'm real visual, if, if I make a picture of it first, if I make a graph first, then I know what the interval notation is going to look like. But this is what the interval notation looks like.
x can be any number strictly to the right of negative 4 forever. And positive infinity says to the right forever. And if when you've got a number line, you're careful to make a either, either note inside of your head or actually outside and write it, if you put your positive infinity here and your negative infinity here, you won't forget to include them in your interval notation. All right, one more way to say this relationship. We're going to use braces. We use braces when we have a set, when we're talking about a set. And this is called set builder notation. We're going to be talking about lots of different kinds of notations in this class. OK, what you do when, you, when you're using set builder notation is you write down the letter you're using. And here we're using the letter x. So if, if you were using the letter p, you would write down p. But you're using the letter x, so you write down x. Then you write a vertical line. Then all you have to do is copy this. So it's not as hard as it looks. And you're done. Here are the four ways to say the same thing. Number two we're going to use the greater than or equal to. If some number I don't know, if some number I don't know is to the right of 1, or it could be actually equal to 1, then it's going to look very similar. The graph is going to look very similar to that, except I'm going to be using a bracket. Okay, so all numbers to the right of 1 or actually equal to 1. I'll put a bracket here and then an arrow going off to the right because it doesn't say anywhere that x is going to stop. It's to the right of 1 and there's nothing stopping it. Okay, the interval notation <coughs> is going to look a lot like this. There's going to be a bracket and the number at the end there, we call it an endpoint, followed by a comma, followed by as far as it goes to the right, which is forever. So your sideways 8 means infinity. Infinity means a whole bunch. So this and this and this say the, the same thing. And then the set builder notation, again, since we're using the letter x, you put the x. Then you put a vertical bar. Then you just copy down that. So that's what I'm going to do. You use interval notation a lot more often than you use set builder notation, but we're going to be doing something at the very end of the semester where the set builder notation is actually easier and your book gives answers in set builder. So that's why you have to be able to read it. It's not used anywhere near as often as interval notation. Okay, now we're going to go off in the other direction. X is to the left of 5, or it's actually equal to 5. Less than or equal to always takes a bracket. And the um, arms, for lack of a better word, the arms of the bracket and the parenthesis always point in the same direction as the arrow. All right, so number 3. We're going to say x is less than or equal to 5. 
And then we're going to say that in four ways. Okay, x is going to be to the left of 5, so it can be any number forever to the left of 5. But it might equal 5. So I'll put a bracket and an arrow. Okay, now uh, these are what I meant by the arms. Okay, and they're pointing in the same direction that the arrow is going. And if you make sure that your letter is always on the left when you're working with what these are called, and these are called inequalities, an equation is an equality because you use an equal sign. These are inequalities, even when equality is included. If your letter is always on the left, then that arrow is always going to point in the direction that that arrow goes. So it makes graphing easier. Then interval notation, what I used to do is I, uh, when I was a student is I would just make my interval notation right under the graph because they look exactly the same. Though it's kind of weird to write backwards. Notice that even when I use a bracket, I put a parenthesis around the infinity sign and the negative infinity sign. You never put a bracket around infinity. There's a reason for that, and that is that infinity is not a number. Infinity is a symbol that means goes on forever. So you can't say that x equals infinity. If you could, you'd put a bracket. But you can't. How can anything ever equal infinity? Okay, so here's your graph, here's your interval notation. Your set builder notation always uses braces, always uses the letter that you're using followed by a vertical line. And then you just copy down whatever it is you're graphing and writing the interval notation for. So you would just copy that down. And this is one of those times when math is a language. Okay, and so we have our own grammar. We have our own equivalents of commas and parentheses and periods, our, our own little grammar marks. Okay, and there we go. There are some of them. If you're interested in putting this into words, It would take a whole lot more words than saying that. But what the words would say is, all the numbers, the set of all the numbers x could equal such that x is less than or equal to 5. So this is saying, consider all the numbers in the universe. We're going to be talking about those numbers that are, le that are less than or equal to 5, or to the left of 5 or equal to 5. All right, so those are the basics. And then in number four and five, numbers four and five, we take it a step further. But I've always liked these better because it actually shows the starting and ending points. Okay, as opposed to, well, it just goes forever. And nobody really understands what that means. These don't go forever. In number four and five, Problems four and five, uh, those don't go on forever, those intervals. Okay, so now, number four is, what it says in English is that x is between negative one on the left and three on the right. That's all it says. X is between those. X is some number we don't know, so we're talking about all the numbers between negative 1 and positive 3. And then, because of those equal two marks underneath, we're also saying, well, and that number we don't know could actually be negative 1 and could actually be 3. So that's all we're saying there. All right, so X is some number. I don't know what it is. If I knew, I'd just say. X is some number we don't know. X is between negative 1 
x is between negative 1 and positive 3. And it might actually equal negative 1, and it might actually equal negative 3. So if this, this is negative 1, this is positive 3, x is anywhere in between there. Okay, we know that x is, um, well, let's see, we like to read that way. So, uh, nah, forget it. This, this is how you say it. Sometimes translating stuff into English is just a total pain. You've got this container going on between negative 1 and positive 3, and we're using brackets because this number we don't know might actually equal either of these two numbers. Might be negative 1, might be 3, heck, I don't know. Could be 0. Could be 0.25. Could be 2.9. I don't know what it is. It's somewhere in there, which is really more like real life. And if you were unlucky enough to be using set builder notation on this, you would say all x such that, and then you would just copy that down. No big deal. Okay, notice I'm using brackets because you've got equal to bars underneath your inequality signs. We always write them going left like that when we say in between. Even though it would be equally as correct to say 3 greater than or equal to x greater than or equal to negative 1, right? 3 is, if x is between negative 1 and 3, then 3 is going to be on the right and negative 1 is going to be on the left. Well, uh, negative, <laughs> x is going to be to the right of negative 1. That would be technically as correct, but the fact is it's not because we just don't do it that way. We always write it this way. There are going to be rare occasions when you get answers that look like this. You have to turn them around. All right, you have to say, okay, where's negative 1 and where's 3? Okay, here's negative 1 and here's 3. So <clears throat> I have to write it that way. Let me do the next one, and then we can, like, discuss all this. But I wanted you to get a feel for it before we actually talk about it and before I answer questions. So moving on to number five. Notice that when we write these, the number that's on the left is written on the left. The number that's on the right is written on the right. Three is definitely on the left of seven. So we're talking about between those two numbers. But now we're saying that x is not going to equal 3, and x is not going to equal 7. It's not going to equal those, but it might actually equal any number in between them, including all the fractions and decimals. Maybe it equals, I don't know, something. Um, so what we're going to do is say, OK, well, clearly x is going to be to the right of 3 and to the left of 7. So if you were going to write this with your arrows going that way, then you would say x is to the left of 7 and, it, and 3 is to the left of x. So I would put a parenthesis around the 3 and a parenthesis around the 7 to show that x is not actually going to equal 3 or 7, and then connect these with a line. You don't even have to put an arrow. It's just enough to connect them with a straight line. And the interval notation looks just like the graph. Over here, you put a 3. Over here, you put a 7, and you put a comma between them to let my math, <clears throat> my math lab and your teacher know that you're not saying 37, you're saying 3, comma, 7. And that's an interval of numbers, all the numbers between 3 and 7. 
and then again to write the set builder notation. You would write the letter, which is x, it won't always be x, and the straight bar, and then you just copy, copy the problem. x is between 3 and 7. So the set of all numbers, such that the numbers are only between 3 and 7, only those numbers between 3 and 7. Could be decimals, could be fractions, could be whole numbers. <laughs> Inequalities, let us admit, are ignorance. Okay, let's discuss this. Yes, ma'am. On number four, isn't you know like where there's the it's gonna fall with the if you draw a line whenever you grab that? Yes, I would. Okay. Like that, yeah. And, it, and there's no way you do it with the one. But if there's a, a definite place that you draw a line between two points. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. I mean, I always found it comforting. I it I just did. I already said that. Boring. I like it better if they end and start somewhere. Personal preference. More questions, more discussion. Doesn't even have to be a question. So we use brackets when it's equal to or to the right of? Um, this would be x is less than or equal to 7. And so we would be talking about all the numbers to the left of 7. Here, if we said x is greater than or equal to 3, we would be talking about all the numbers equal to 3 or greater than 3. Okay. okay, so it doesn't matter what direction you're going in. It's Is there a possibility that x could equal that end point? If there is, then you use a bracket. Good question. Oops, I got one. Oh, you got one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so whenever we're taking the test, <laughs> um, you want the answers all in interval notation. Um, the instructions will say. Okay. And you'll get used to that on my math lab. The instructions tell you how to answer. Those, those nasty little blue instructions that are underneath the answer box, Always read those because those will tell you what the right answer, what the, what the right form for the answer is. Some of them will just say, some of the instructions will just say, hey, choose a graph. Which graph is right? Some of the instructions will say, give the interval notation. Some will just say, fill in the interval notation. Others will say, actually make the interval notation. I don't think there are a lot that ask about set builder. Ma'am. Do you do a mix of computer and written? Or do you I print it off from the computer. So if you practice the practice test, then. It's all in paper Yeah. And do you offer partial points for. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Always go for the partial credit. Yeah, just because you don't know how to do the whole thing doesn't mean you don't get credit for some of it on the paper test. Nobody would pass if they didn't give partial credit. <laughs> more questions, more discussion. Wow, this is new and exciting. All right, now, on the back, there are three problems. And we're going to actually solve inequalities. But the thing is, and this is actually an interesting thing. I think it's interesting, but I'm a nerd. What are you going to do? Inequalities are a lot more interesting than equations, because in equations, most of the time you only get one answer. 
you know, you solve it, you have x equals 2 or something like that. Um, with inequalities, you get an infinite number of answers. So for instance, it's kind of hard to believe, but between 3 and 7, there are an infinite number of possible answers when you look at all the decimals, all the little bitty decimals. Okay, now, if you're saying, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, you said there are an infinite number of numbers on the number line, on the whole number line, and there are. How can you say there are an infinite number of possible numbers in here when this is smaller than that? And one of the, one of the secrets of the universe, God help us all, is that there are different levels of infinity. And if you go far enough in math, you'll actually have to deal with it. But perhaps I'm enticing some of you. Whoa, I never heard that. I think I'll take those classes. Yeah. Then you can get crazy, too. <laughs> well, I went to infinity last night, and let me tell you. <laughs> it's true. I'm not joking. It's really true. But that's all I'm going to say about it. We're going to do that problem, okay? We're going to let infinity take care of itself. Number six. Eighteen x minus twelve is strictly greater than. And it's good to emphasize that so that you're not going to be thinking bracket. You know, strictly means just parenthesis, parentheses. 3 times 5x minus 6. Okay, so we're going to have 18x minus 12 is strictly greater than 15x minus 18. And there we are. Not done. But most of the time, most of the time, to solve an inequality, you take exactly the same steps as solving an equation. And we'll have, we'll have the opportunity to meet when there's a difference. But most of the time, you just pretend you're solving an equation. You do exactly the same steps. So for instance, I'm going to gather my variable terms together on the left, and my number terms, my constant terms, together on the right. So I'll subtract 15x from both sides of the, of the inequality. 18 minus 15 is 3, so I'll have 3x, bring down the minus 12, is greater than the 15x is zeroed out, and so you're left with a negative 18. OK. I've got one variable term here. I've got two constant terms, so I'm going to move this over here by adding 12 to both sides. The reason to do that is so you can get it to zero out over here, and it'll make whatever, whatever number it makes over there. So negative 18 plus 12 is going to be negative 6. Bring that down just like you would an equal sign. And I'll have 3x. And then just like with an equation, I would divide by 3 and divide by 3 so that I would get x is strictly greater than negative 2. Or, if you prefer, x is to the right of negative 2. So. I graph it. Actually, I do whatever the instructions ask me to do. Write the solution set in interval notation and graph it. Well, frankly, I graph first just because then it's easier to get the interval notation for me. So I need this. This is what I need. This is called the solution of the inequality.
because we solved it. We're, we now are saying the answer is all the numbers to the right of negative 2, not including negative 2. So here's 0, here's negative 1, here's negative 2. And this is a nice little picture. The graph, that's the, the, all of the numbers that could be answers to that. And then the interval notation will have a parenthesis on the left, write the end point, negative 2, write a comma, then write the end point over there, but there isn't one. Right? So you write infinity. And it didn't ask us to write set builder notation. So that's enough. And those are all the possible answers you could have to that inequality. We used exactly the same steps that you would have used if there were an equal sign there instead of an inequality sign. Yes? Um, if we were going to put it in set builder notation, would we put the x and then the line and then the, the problem that it started out as, or would we plug the, the solution into that part? Excellent. That one. Let's do it, even though they didn't ask. There you go. That's the answer, right? Yeah, that's how you would do the set builder notation if you were asked to. divide by negative, does it sometimes turn the sign? Yes. Yeah. But how do you know when to do that? I'll show you. One of these problems will let us do it. So let's move on to the next one. Oh, number seven, actually. That's the only time you don't do the exact same things that you would do if you were solving an equation. Okay, did I copy that right? I should say correctly. Okay, first thing you always do with an equation or an inequality, you always get rid of your parentheses first. Okay, now with an inequality, you always want to bring your letters over to the left, your, your variables, because if you do that, then you'll always know exactly which direction to draw your arrow in. Okay, it just makes it a little bit easier. Okay, so I've isolated my variable terms on the left. Now I'm going to subtract 15 over to the right. So that's going to give me negative 18 on the right and negative 3r on the left, and I'm going to write it up here so everyone can see. All right, now that you have this down to a variable term, a constant term, and inequality sign. If this were a regular equation, you would divide both sides by negative 3. Well, we're going to do that. But this is the problem with inequalities. This is how they're different from equations. If you divide both sides by a negative number, you have to turn the inequality sign around. And you want to try to do it all in the same step so you don't forget. So the negative 3's cancel out, leaving you with R. Now your sign is turned around. Negative 18 divided by negative 3 is positive 6. And that's the answer. And that's how you know to do it. It doesn't matter whether this is positive or negative. It doesn't matter whether you're adding or subtracting positive or negative terms from both sides. The absolute only time you turn your sign around is if there's a negative number in front of the variable. So 
it's kind of nice there are 12 times you have to remember. Okay, then we just go ahead and we graph what you've got here. Okay, and we're saying here R is to the right of 6 or it can actually equal 6. So this is one of those times that you actually use a bracket. And then an arrow going off to the right if you're graphing this. And the interval notation looks almost exactly like this. You're going to have a bracket on the left, just like this has a bracket on the left. You're going to write 6, and then comma, and then the ending point on the right, but there isn't one. So you write infinity. And the set builder. Now this is a time when the set builder would be interesting. You're not asked to do it. But what it would be would be R, because you're using the letter R in the problem. All R such that, and then R is greater than or equal to 6. If you were asked to do that, and you're not, so you wouldn't. That can be tricky. So when I was a student, I said to myself, well, that's really stupid. I've got to remember to turn, a neg to turn the sign around if I divide by a negative number. All I had to do was instead of uh, adding 9R to both sides so I got a negative 3, I could just add 12 to both sides and I'd get a positive 3. And I would wind up with um, whatever I would end up with and the R would be over here, and, well, I suppose, 3R less than or equal to 18. And then I would divide by 3 and divide by 3 so that I would have 6 is greater than or equal to R, and then have to figure out which way it goes. But no, it wouldn't be that way. Let me do it. It would not end up that way. I just found it much too hard, and I'd end up getting it wrong anyway. But I'm going to do it that way, and we'll see how to do it. So we'll do this, we'll do this, and from here, I'll have negative 12R plus 15 is less than or equal to negative 9r minus 3. Now, if I went in the other direction, I wouldn't have to deal with a negative in front of the letter. That's true. So these would zero out. I'd be left with 15. Here I would have positive 3r, and here I'd have minus 3. So I would add plus 3, and I would add plus 3, so that I would have 18 is less than or equal to 3R, so that 6 is less than or equal to R. Now notice what direction the line has to go in to be correct. And somehow you would have to work out, okay, 6 is less than any number r could be. Well, I know that 6 is less than 7. So let's say that r might equal 7, but it can't equal 6 because 6 would be less than it is. Oh, it might equal 6. But what could r not be? r could not be 5, right? For sure r could not be 5. So I would have to like go through this whole process, which I think is really difficult, before I would come up with, oh yeah, okay, there's the six, there, yeah, that's what we're saying. See, R can be anything over here, so six is less than or equal to any number R could be. To me, that, uh, the way I think, it's totally backwards. But if your learning style, if to your learning style that makes sense, 
Go for it. All right, we're going to end up with this. This is called a three-part inequality. And I actually think it's kind of cool because think about everything that you know about solving equations. And, it, and now, what are you doing? This is a negative attitude. Shake in your hand? No. Nah. Think about everything you know about solving equations. You know, you add the same thing to both sides, right? You subtract the same thing from both sides. Well, with these, you add the same thing to three sides. You subtract the same thing from three sides. You divide the same thing into three sides. You just do it one more time. This is manageable. OK, there is our three-part inequality. It's got three parts, part one, part two, part three. Your goal, Mr. Phelps, the message is going to self-destruct soon, so be careful. Your goal, your mission, is to get T by itself in the middle. OK? And here's how you do it. You say, OK, if this were an equation here, let's come over here and actually make an equation. There, I'll, I'll use one of the numbers there. If this were an equation, this is what I would do first. I would subtract 1 from both sides, right? Minus 1, minus 1, and I would get 2t equals 12. So I am going to come over here, and I'm going to do it to three sides. There, there, and there. See, is that cool? How often do you get to do that? 1 minus 1 is 0. I know that already. So I'll be left with 2t in the middle, less than or equal to 12, greater than or equal to 7 minus 1 is 6. So you've got 6 is less than or equal to 